Hey everybody, welcome back to the Amos Keg Northern. This is the December 2021 layout update and we've got quite a bit to go over on this one. Uh, we're gonna go look at the layout. We'll take a look at Mandrake Falls. Uh, we'll see where the track work is progressing there on the west end of Mandrake Falls through to the west end staging uh, due to the elimination of the swing bridge. Uh, we've got a bunch of motor power that is on the way and um, that should be here some point. I mean, maybe it might be in next month's video. Currently half of the order of uh, motor power is stuck at the USPS distribution center in Harrisburg. Um, as of this coming Tuesday, which will be December 21st, it'll be there for three weeks. And um, I, I know it's the holiday shipping season, but my God, that is just taking forever. And it still has to get to Nashville, which is another black hole. If you've ever ordered anything from northern New England and it's had to go through Nashville USPS, holy man, you, you, you know how it can go in there and then maybe a month later it comes out. So, um, like I said, maybe the engines will be here. Maybe they won't. We shall see. Uh, but those engines uh, play a role in... Uh, the refinement of the history of the Amos Kig Northern. So I briefly touched on that in last month's episode where there was some changes uh, to the history of the Amos Kig Northern. And when I say changes to the history, it sometimes uh, sets some people off because uh, they're always like, you're always changing it. You're always changing it. Like, just pick something and stick with it. Well, there's always been an end game for the Amos Kig Northern. And uh, we're going to go over that in a, a video, a full-length video coming up where we talk about the whole history of the Amoskeg Northern and the maps and whatnot. And the maps will be up shortly on the Facebook page. Um, but I've, I've always had an end game. It's just how, that, how do we get there? And I'm a very OCD kind of a person. It just it has to make sense. It has to be plausible. If this is dependent upon this and this doesn't work, then this doesn't happen. So now you're back to like figuring out that. And you know, which seems kind of insane when we're talking about model trains in a fantasy world in our basement and f freelanced at that. So it's even worse. It's it's not like we're modeling NS or 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 CP or, or whatever railroad, like this is completely made up. So you could be like, oh, my railroad, my rules. Yeah, it doesn't work. It doesn't work in my head. It, it has to make sense. If it doesn't make sense, it doesn't work. So the biggest stumbling block, or the only stumbling block for the Amoskeg Northern is how does it get to the Midwest? Um, the, the Amoskeg Northern starts its origin in the mid 1800s uh, from the um, the railroad that went from um, Chicago to Portland, Maine uh, through Oswego or Oswego, however you pronounce that in New York. Um, a majority of that line was built, except for the New Hampshire and Maine section. Well, half of the New Hampshire section, the the, the Northern Railroad and the Northern Main Line is part of that railroad. But from um, half of New Hampshire through Maine, it was never built because the guy who was planning it died. Um, so there's always been a hang-up as how does, after all the railroad baron mergers and whatnot in the late 1800s and early 1900s, how does the Amoskeg Northern go from you know, New England to into New York and Pennsylvania and Ohio and potentially Indiana and Illinois. So luckily over the last month or so, details about Guilford's expansion into the Midwest and eventually the West Coast, um, details have come out. Now we've all known that Guilford wants to do it and it just seems like some insane pipe dream that was just like, what are these people thinking? Um, because there hasn't been a lot of information out there about it. But lately, more details have come out from some people behind the scenes or, you know, been part of the whole grand scheme. Um, and and I, I can attribute to this, I think, without, you know, as a, any hesitancy, that the pending sale of Pan Am to CSX has allowed these people to speak more freely and allowed information from Bill Ricca to come out more freely. 
And what really interested me were the failed attempts at um, acquiring major portions of Conrail in the 1985 bid with NS, and then again in the 1997 bid with CSX and NS. And those details have really helped me to get rid of that stumbling block as to how does the Amskeg Northern go from here to there. Like, I know I always wanted to get here, but how, how do we get this pad in between? And like I said, there'll be a whole new video where I talk about this in detail. But basically, the simple thing comes down to Ha ha, we got it and you didn't. I mean, we all know based upon reality that Guilford didn't get it. So why not just take the details of the facts and just put another person into the works and we did. So that's that refinement on the history and that's why all this motive power comes into play. And you'll see it when it eventually gets here. But in the interim... Uh, what I've been working on is customer projects. So I got a bunch of custom painting that I've been working on, uh, a bunch of DCC installs, uh, all sound installs. I have the TCS Wow Sound, ESU Loke Sound. It's it's not lock. We have locomotives. So not locomotives. Um, and then one of my favorite things, and one of the things I hate the most, also. Um, are some of the uh, custom finishing models maintenance away kits. Uh, I have quite a few of these that I'm doing for a customer and um, they're just tedious but they're fun. I really like uh, craftsman kits and I would consider these a craftsman kits akin to a, a structure kit from like South River Model Works or or Foss scale models. Uh, they are just heavy in detail and heavy in time required to build most most of these kits i'd say are 40 plus hours especially the um the mark 4 tampers or the jackson 6700 tampers those are all uh, production tampers i'd say those are easily 60 plus hours and there are a few kits from um from custom finishing that are able to be banged out in an hour or two but a majority of them are are a lot and they're really nice kits. They're highly detailed. And they're one of those things that you don't see a lot on people's layouts. Like the maintenance away is what keeps the trains rolling. It keeps the cars upright and on the rails. And um, it's the backbone of the railroad. Um, but nobody really has them on their layouts. I think mostly it's because these are very intense kits. Um, it re they're all metal. Um, and wire and brass and decals and the, you've got to paint them yourself. So you've got to clean up all the flash and all the metal pieces and glue them and epoxy them together, then prime, prime it, then paint it. And then you've got to do what I think is the worst part, but what's what really makes these kits. Um, and that's the windows, which is this clear acetate plastic that you you, you gotta you gotta cut them out and glue them on uh, like clear parts glue and whatnot um and then the hydraulic hoses like some of these things there's like 200 300 hydraulic hoses on the damn thing um and you could easily like ah, i'm not i'm not gonna put those on there i mean you can you can build them and put them on and not put them on and it's gonna look all right but it's all this the the glass work and the hoses that i think that really makes it and it's it's tedious it really is and um, it's just daunting when you've got so many of them to do. I think uh, I've got a bunch of these for my for my layout. I you've seen them here and there on on the Facebook page, um, but you know the, I think this one order um, for Kevin I think is six or seven of these. And you're, you're looking at anywhere from 40 to 60 hours a piece on each one of them. So, I mean, they take a while, but um, I, I really I really like building them. So, but, all right, let's go take a look at the layout. And you guys can see what's going on. And then uh, you can throw comments below uh, as to it's constantly changing. So, all right, let's go take a look. 
All right, let's take a look at a couple things on the layout. So this is the west end, where the main line enters uh, the west end staging. It goes through the backdrop at this location and into the utility room into the staging tracks. And to uh, soften that transition between going through the backdrop and on the main layout, I've been working on uh, getting this bridge roughed in, and then I'll get the scenery roughed in and patch up the holes that I had drilled as pilot holes through the uh, backdrop. Uh, and that will just kind of act as a view block to just ease the transition from uh, coming through the backdrop and into the main section of the layout. I've got all of Station Street installed uh, with the curb work and sidewalks. Uh, right now I've got the initial layer of paint down on it and I am uh, got some Mr. Putty sitting on the seam so I can get those sanded down. These are the Walther's uh, street kits and they use the kits interchangeably for both concrete and asphalt roadways. So if you're doing an asphalt roadway you you got to kind of sand in or uh, fill in the seam lines and sand them down. So I've got two coats of the Mr. Putty on there right now. This is the third. Probably going to need a fourth or a fifth uh, to kind of uh, smooth out those seam lines so you don't have that pan that concrete panel looking like uh, street once it gets painted. Um, starting to mock up some of the signaling system. Uh, I'm going to be using the Azatrax infrared signals for their, their signal controllers. I'd seen them a few years ago over in Springfield and really liked them. I, I had some of the, the Digitrax SE8Cs, but I must have either sold them or lost them at some point in time during a move or transition from a layout because I looked in my electronics box and I cannot find them. I have all my BDL 168s, but I cannot find them any of my SE8Cs. So the cost to replace them compared to using the Azatrax is quite similar and the Azatrax will handle all the logic for me. I just tell him how I want it to go and then he'll do all the NORAC um, signal logic for me. So it'll make things a lot easier in the long run. Now when it comes to with using it with JMRI, obviously the dispatcher can't control the signal aspects um, because he doesn't have any control over the, the logic. It uses the logic built into a board and it just it uses a tumble down system so it figures out what the other boards are doing. Um, we'll go over that more in detail in another video but the dispatcher can have some quasi control by putting um, resistors across the roadway um, or the track I should say. Um, the dispatcher can then kind of take over or allow it to tumble down to the different uh, boards to kind of get use some situations that you might want to deal with. So we'll take a look at that uh, in another video. So we've been working on Callahan Auto. You may have seen a photo of this um, on the Facebook page. This is a large structure. This is made, I think, from the Walther's American Hardware kits. I know it's a Walther's kit, but I think it's American Hardware, another, another one of the kits. I can't recall exactly which one. Uh, this is going to ultimately be a kit bash of four of those kits and it takes um, box cars for outbound finish project and uh, box cars and coil cars for uh, inbound raw materials like uh, sheet steel cardboard for packaging and whatnot and then it will ship out finished brake pads and brake pad accessories Got some power sitting on the main line. We'll take a look at that another time. We'll talk about that. Um, so most of the track work on the main line through this section, about 90% of it is complete to get it tagged back in with the rest of the layout. Just as we go through Amoskeg Yard over there on the other side, uh, there's a couple sections that I'm waiting for them to come in. So, uh, But on the east end here, Amoskeg Yard, Market basket has been moved from the uh, south side of the tracks and north side of the tracks. Uh, in its previous orientation, it was based upon Manchester where it faces west, and so it's on the right-hand side of the, the end of uh, the 
um, Manchester Yard. With the track reconfiguration in this area, it just fit better um, on the north side of the tracks. So it would be facing towards you. So you got to get all the details still added onto this. So it's just a mock-up box at this point in time. So you got to get all the doors, um, the signage, which is made on a 3D printer. You get that all finished up. So got the hand throw switches. Uh, so this will require you to open up with the dispatcher to get into the yard. Amoskeg Yard is not a very large yard. Um, in Mandrake Falls, it's a remnant of itself. It's pretty much down to like two, three tracks. If you've ever looked at the overhead of uh, Portsmouth, New Hampshire's yard, uh, it's pretty much based off of that and a little bit of Manchester as well, where they were large classification yards for the area during the uh, 60s and 70s, and then the 80s they started to dwindle, and now they're just a few you know, a few tracks here and there, basically as small storage parts um, for the uh, local traffic. So, so as we come into the yard here, yeah, it's pretty much nothing at this point in time. Uh, what was once a large yard is now going to have maybe two or three tracks in it to store, maybe 10, 15 cars at most. Uh, the roundhouse will be falling apart. It was once several stalls and now it's just three and it's basically just a place to put the local power uh, under cover but nothing like it used to be uh, this is the overpass over i-93 uh, this has been made with a bunch of atlas bridge parts which i really really like these atlas through girder bridges these are the, the newer ones um, the code 83 ones i think they might have it in code 100 as well but uh, this uses a lot of 3D printed parts as well. So all the uh, bridge abutment pieces, uh, the center piers, the end wing walls, and the center parts uh, on the ends are all 3D printed on uh, my 3D printer in resin. So, and that's pretty much it for this month. Um, be a lot more coming probably the next month after we get out of the Springfield show. The plan is to go to the Springfield show at this point in time, uh, unless some things change uh, in Massachusetts, which is always seems to be a week to week thing. So, well, hopefully we'll see you guys down there and uh, we'll see you in the next update. So thanks again for coming along and taking a look.